It's all over. I'm going to miss the Acolyte. Sure, the show wasn't that good, but the reviews have been great. Episode 8 of The Acolyte doesn't really serve to tie up all of the plot threads. Pardon the pun. It actually adds multiple new threads that are clearly sequel bait. And some massive member berries that will have you shaking your head in disbelief. My reviews thus far have typically been 3 to 5 pages long. Occasionally stretching to 6. This review has taken me a little under 10 pages because every scene basically has something that contradicts previous scenes or is so mind-numbingly stupid I had to point it out to laugh at it. As per usual, the sets, props and effects are all terrific. I've said it before, but it seems like these are almost a solved art. There doesn't seem to be too much of an excuse to fail in these areas anymore with the exception of budget, which the Acolyte does not have to worry about. $180 million the budget for this show allegedly was, given to produce this slot. Costumes are a bit of a letdown. I guess they were going for more simplistic designs, but nothing really stood out as being particularly noteworthy. Even the senator that appears in this episode had some sort of a shapeless moo moo kind of deal going on. I'll throw this episode a bone and say it's not the worst of all the episodes. That honour goes to episode 7 in tandem with 3 for their straight up lying to us viewers and wasting our time showing different angles of the same scenes. Episode 8 of The Acolyte gets a 4 out of 10 from me. There's some stupid stuff with people changing allegiances willy nilly and things again have been poached from Star Wars Legends or the Expanded Universe. Some of these things that have been stolen make no sense unless you have someone there to explain what they mean. That's just bad story writing. Like it seems half of the viewers have no idea who the creepy monster man in the cave even was. I had seen artwork of this character so at least I knew his name and where he fits into the Star Wars canon. But seeing him wasn't some kind of exciting moment. It was more of a case of, oh they dug him out. People who belong to this new audience they're trying to cultivate would have zero clue and zero cares. It's just a bizarre decision. I won't go into too much detail about the season as a whole. I'll leave that to the next video where I discuss that, as well as the implications it has on the wider Star Wars universe. The final episode of The Acolyte rejoins Osha and Kamir in the cave on planet name number 207 not found. Osha has Kamir's helmet on and it looks way too bulky for her. In fact, this scene looks like one of those mall photo booths they used to have. Here they were called Pixie Photo and you'd get photos taken of your kids. They always seem to have a backdrop of a country road covered in autumn leaves. This just reminds me of some poor kid being awkwardly posed for one of those photos. But I digress. Osha starts struggling to breathe and Kamir tries to take the helmet off. But he gets mind freaked into the nether realm that Mother Anus Slayer takes Torben to in episodes 3 and 7. He even has the same black eyes effect like doll's eyes. Now, who did this? As it is the same as what happened to Torben, I'm assuming that it was done by Osha. Did she mean to do it? Was she aware that it was happening? We'll never know because it's never mentioned. Kamir doesn't say, hey when I was trying to get the helmet off, something strange happened. Oh well, if the show doesn't care about it, I won't either. It just seems like you could put someone you're fighting into a trance and defeat them easily. Kind of seems too overpowered not to use. A cool little effects note is that when Kamir takes the helmet off when Osha is seeing visions of May, there's a red lightsaber effect reflected in her eyes. Cool, but stupid. Does the force actually manifest tiny images of what you're seeing in front of you? If someone is seeing a force vision, could everyone else see it reflected in their eyes? Something that will never happen again in Star Wars. So they agree that they have to get to May, and Kamir says, I'm taking my ship. How are you going to get there? But Osha tells him that he doesn't know where they are, so she'll have to come with him. There's a line here that some people have said was stupid, but I'm okay with it. Kamir says that they'll go together and see who gets to her first. Their issue is that if they're both taking the same ship, they'll both arrive at the same time. But I can see it as meaning who will convince her to join them. Get to in the sense of how do I reach these kids? isn't about arriving at their location. It's about coming to an understanding. Anyway, enough about that. Sol has taken May to Brendock. He has alerted Vanestra of his location so he can prove that the planet has a virgins. 
So the girls aren't the virgins. They are the product of the virgins. Is the virgins the gaping hole in the ground that the witches were worshipping? If so, why is it not shown at all in this episode? He's talking to May as if she would even know who Master Finestra is. Unless Kamir told her about her? May was assumed dead until a few days ago, so she's never been introduced to Finestra. Unless Vanessa is so well known throughout the galaxy like Star Wars version of Donald Trump. And just like I said in episode 6 of the Acolyte two weeks ago, why has he let her keep Pip? It's not even her robot, it's her sister's. Clearly she was going to use it to escape her cuffs. This is the kind of writing that annoys me, where they have an idea for someone to escape, but it requires normally competent people to act like complete buffoons. Once again, Sol has to bury the lead and get caught up in the slanging match instead of telling May what actually happened. Your mum turned into some spooky ghost type creature and started dissolving you in front of my eyes. I'm a Jedi, I'm trained to draw my saber at the slightest threat. Why did I cover it up? Well you see, my boss, this other woman, she told me I had to keep it a secret because she thought your sister had already lost her entire family and way of life. She needed some support right now, rather than being confused about what happened. What was I supposed to tell her? That her mother was a monster? Why did we blame you? You were brainwashed by Mother Coral to trap everyone inside the mine and set the fire to the building. I'm sorry, what did you think would happen? You're an adult now. You can shoulder some of the blame. Let's not forget that you've been killing Jedi, as well as putting innocent civilians' lives at stake to get your revenge. Don't you remember that bit on the bridge where I tried to save you both? Remember how I held the bridge up instead of holding up the very light children? Remember when you told us that you were being sacrificed at the ascension ceremony? Yeah, that was you, May. So Sol tries to tell May that they're not sisters, they're the same person. But of course he gets right up close to her while she's picking her lock so she can zap him with the new and improved pip that can read your thoughts and change its function based on what you're thinking. What was the point of them being the same person? Is that there to explain why they can't be distinguished by Jedi mind tricks? Even though one of them has a big white tattoo on a forehead? I don't think the tattoo came into play once throughout the entire season. We mainly knew who they were based off what they were wearing or where they were. Maybe we also knew based on the music changing or the actor giving shifty looks when playing May. But the tattoo was not ever a giveaway. In fact, when May was with Kamiya, her hair was always parting to reveal the tattoo all the time. But whenever she was with Sol, her hair always strategically covered their forehead. Like a piece of seaweed covering a mermaid's boobs. Oh my god, I'd forgotten about Basil. That little turd, I hate him so much. There's an escape ship? Why wasn't this ever mentioned before? How convenient. So other ships have escape pods, this one has an escape ship? It would have been better if this was some sort of scouting vessel to allow the occupants to split up. Sol never once uses the force in his chase. He could have stopped the door closing or stopped May from running. Only when it's convenient. Did they just steal a line from Han Solo and Hoth? Is Sol's Tauntaun going to freeze before he reaches the first marker? The line doesn't even make sense here. Han Solo is going to die if he leaves the base. May is just escaping Sol's perfectly functional ship. How does she even get into that seat without opening the canopy? Wait, this ship has a docking bay the size of a basketball court? Why couldn't Torben have taken the ship back to Coruscant on the weekends? This seems to be where a lot of the budget went. These particle effects look great. But May's voice is so low in the mix, I need subtitles here. And Amanda Stenberg's acting is so subdued. You're on the run, at least act like it's exciting. Is Sol trying to destroy May or apprehend her? Is that a gun or a tractor beam? We'll never know. Let's assume it's a gun because the Jedi are the Star Wars analogue for cops and they're all bastards, remember? Bloody Basil. Two episodes ago, Basil attacked May because he knew she wasn't Osha. Now he's defending her by sabotaging the ship. Well, I hope you're happy Basil because you cut Sol's brakes and he knocked May into a spin and now she's spinning out of control. You probably killed her. May tells Pip to brace yourself. Lady, he doesn't have arms or any kind of limbs. This is as bad as a soul telling that eyelidless Padawan to close his eyes in episode one. 
That is seriously a 10 second flight time from Brendock's rings to touchdown. This planet must have some serious gravity. We'll just put it down to the virgins. Oh, and May's ship skips across the surface of the planet like a skimming stone, leaving her unmarked. We'll put that down to the virgins too. Plus, they made ships better in the old days. Surviving a free fall from orbit was just how they did things back a hundred years ago. Another happy landing. Back on Coruscant, Master of Venestra has to deal with more toxic masculinity from Mog. The way they play this guy in this scene makes it seem like he has some sort of ulterior motive and is trying to undermine Venestra. But she continues to seek him out for assistance. Talk about stealing the show. This senator is played brilliantly and is probably my third favourite performance in the entire season behind Kamir and Sol. Talk about gravitas. Who is going to police the police is his basic sentiment. If you abolish the Jedi, these people are still going to be force sensitive. They just won't have training in how to use it. And the way lightsabers are just left lying around the place, it's not exactly difficult to come across one. The Sith managed to get their hands on them. Pretty brave of the producers to mock may the force be with you, considering it's one of the most recognisable quotes in the franchise. There's a day of the year named after it after all. A wild schnoodler appears. I guess that means we're back on unknown planet. Wait, the tide goes out that far? That walkway was underwater, now it's 10 feet above sea level. Where did Osha get this cute little dark grey number with the hood? Did Kamir just have it lying around or is it one of May's outfits? I'm pretty sure May didn't live there because May had no idea that Kamir was even the stranger. What's with the stilted dialogue in this show? Sentences just cut off mid, um, sentence? Would you even consider it? There should be an it on the end. What deal? You asked her if she wanted to be trained and she said no. Now that you're saying that there was a deal? That's an offer, not a deal. Is this written by AI? Uh-oh, there's a spooky monster man in their cave. What a stupid reveal. No one knows who this is and no one cares. Like, some people thought it was Mother Coral because she was never actually shown as deceased. Some people, like myself, assumed it was Darth Plagueis. But there's nothing to confirm it. And the kind of people who they are making this series for are not the kind of people who have read Star Wars Expanded Universe books to even know who Darth Plagueis is beyond Have I ever told you the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? And what's he doing there? Was he just in the back room? Could Osha have walked in on him on the toilet? Where even is the toilet? Are they just crapping off the rocks into the sea? We're having to assume everything here. I assume he's been training Kamir since he left the Jedi Academy. Now what? Where does the giant foot of Sol's ship go when it's in flight? It would take up all of the cabin space. Fuggin' Basil, man. Go on, have a good sniff. I hope Sol farted in the pilot's chair before he left. So Vanestra is trying to see someone. Is it just me? Or does that sound like Palpatine? Or is it just Yoda's personal assistant, you know, so they can say it wasn't just a member berry, but it was actually set up in a previous scene. And that phone thing she's talking into is trying so hard to be the thing Han Solo talks to on the detention level. Jeez, Kamir's ship has two cockpits and the ability to turn one cockpit off and he lets Osha use the cockpit that still functions. What a gentleman. But seriously, what did she think he was going to do? Just because he's Asian doesn't mean he's a bad driver, Osha. Gotta give credit to Sol's actor. He sure can emote and act with his whole body. Luckily, the power still works, and all that was broken was the control panel. No rats chewed the wires, or they didn't burn out in the fire. I've seen some people say that the generator blew up in episodes 3 and 7, but that's not definite. Some piece of equipment blew up. It could have been the generator, or it could have been any number of other pieces of mining equipment. Hell, it could have even been their sweet gaming PC. Sol doing his best Finn impression. May! Ray! One thing I like about this lightsaber fight is that the sabers damage the environment. It's nice to see that happen for a change. The only other example I can think of this is Grievous with his helicopter trick. This crouching tiger hidden dragon shot had me confused. I couldn't tell if they were falling slowly or if the action was slowed down. I guess I'm just used to a when the action is slowed down. I think what I like most about Kamir's fighting style is that he's never not in motion. 
he's always transitioning to his next strike. It makes him seem extra deadly. One false move and he's going to tag you. Some pretty cool moves, the double saber throw and the force whirlwind. Shame these things aren't used more often. Just putting his saber back together into one unit give him greater reach or more powerful strikes. I suppose it would become more like a claymore, double handed for stronger blows. What the hell? May tries to tell Osha that Sol tried to blame her for what happened. Then Osha says Sol never blamed you. He tried to convince me to forgive someone who could cause this much destruction. Sounds a lot like blaming someone to me. Maybe they meant resent. Sol told me not to resent you. You made a mistake and I should just let it go. Do you think they could stand any stiller during this dialogue? They couldn't at least pace around or point or something. Wait. So May just told Osha that Sol killed their mother, and that he's lied to her, and now they're fighting. Shouldn't she be assessing this new information? So May looks at Pip, and they just stand there while Pip spurts all over her face. Oh dear god no, not the discordant chanting. Do -dee -da. Remember kids, staying in key and rhythm are tools of the patriarchy. Interesting cut on action there as the crossed kicks turn into crossed sabers. Someone went to film school. That sequence of Kamir trying to pull Sol's blade into his Cortosis helmet was a bit silly. Kamir could have just booped Sol on the head with his blade and Sol could have angled his blade toward Kamir's shoulder. But I guess we got what everyone's been talking about for ages. Why not turn off your blade in a clinch? Just like Matthew McCleskey said. And then Sol cuts Kamir's saber in half with a beautiful cover drive. That's gone for four runs. Don't even bother running for that one, Solly. Why does Kamir throw his saber away? He still has his little Tanto style blade attached to the hilt. Now Sol has him at the point of his blade. Oh no! If only he had some kind of anti lightsaber armor, he could disable his lightsaber. Say, what's that in your hand, Kamir? And did he lose his arm bracer? But luckily, May arrives after about 15 minutes and steals Sol's lightsaber right out of his hand. I'll put that down to him being exhausted from fighting for his life. What I can't excuse is the fact that my eye is constantly drawn to May's thumb on that saber button and then the contrast to the reverse angle. Come on! Wow, if there's one cliche in Star Wars, it's lightsabers being dropped. This is the first time I've seen one take damage from a fall. Why doesn't Sol just force pull his saber to him? Test it out, he's got nothing to lose. Ah, so Palpatine was paraphrasing Kamir when he said, Strike me down with all of your hatred, and your journey towards the dark side will be complete. Did they mess up the editing? Shouldn't he have told her to strike him down while she had the saber? And then had her throw it and say no? What is she going to strike him down with? Her fists? Bro. Sol kung fu'd you on Kofar with ease when you disarmed him. Why isn't Sol just leaving now that things have gone pear-shaped? Go get the rest of the Jedi. Wait, so other people have been created by the Force before May and Osha? So this kind of thing happens from time to time? I'm not sure how Osha can hear him whispering that he did kill their mother from all the way over there. Poor old Sol, acting his heart out, emoting all over the place. What a contrast. Bro, mention their mum turning into a spooky ghost and disintegrating May after she said that she had to be sacrificed during the ascension. Stop talking is right. It's the theme of this entire show. I need to tell you something very important. But first, let me preface with this story about the time I caught the ferry over to Shelbyville. He admits it. He was just about to say I did everything because I love killing little girls' mums and taking them away to be trained as Jedi because I think it's funny. What an animal. Uh-oh. The exposed kyber crystals pierced Osha's skin and is causing her blood to get on it. Turning it red. Plus a little bit of anger. And maybe some of the force virgins in this place. How can he talk while he's being choked? It's okay. It's okay. Because we can't have a woman being responsible for her own actions. No, she's totally justified and turned to the dark side. Go for it. Kill your former master in anger. It's fine. Luckily, Kamir could see that swing coming. Is she now back to hating him for killing Jackie and Yord? So we were right about there being some kind of relationship between Kamir and Vernestra. 
She reaches out with the Force and senses his presence. Shame we're about 10 minutes from the end of the series. Kamir does a disappearing act. I'm not sure why he couldn't take the girls with him. Osha is still staring at the lightsaber in her hand 30 seconds later and May hasn't moved a muscle. It's as if these events are happening simultaneously, yet Kamir is acting as if they are happening concurrently. Fenestra puts all of her forced door opening practice to good use and opens the door to the coven with ease. May pulled the Luke Skywalker on Bespin 150 years before it was cool and fell down a pit into a tunnel. Amazing. So there's a dead Jedi and Vanestra tells two Jedi to search the premises. Why are they splitting up? There's someone here who is capable of killing a Jedi. Stick together, you idiots! Wait, if Kamir is trying to avoid Vanestra, why did he hide nearby instead of fleeing? Oh, so they could channel Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original movie when he says hello there to R2-D2. That's why, you idiot! So Vanestra told them to set up a perimeter, but then to use the tracker. I think they confused perimeter with search party. If it was a perimeter, they would be forming a circle, not all bunched up, slowly wandering around behind Basil. So May admits to starting the fire, even though Osha knew she started it, and it's a huge revelation. Sol admitting he killed your mother was less shocking than this. Wait, so now they're claiming that the Jedi killed the witches because they were too powerful? Where did that come from? So 20 minutes ago these women were trying to kill each other and now one's willing to have her brain erased to help the other become a Sith Lord. Did the writers try this technique on themselves? So you can selectively erase things from your brain now. That would have all kinds of uses. At least make it a 30 minute ritual during a full moon so there's some kind of restriction on it. Or this will be one of the most powerful force powers ever. I will find you. You won't have any idea who I am when you see me, but I'll find you. Why isn't she asking, who are you two? She has no memory of these people. And the Jedi know that she has a sister, and that Kamir is still alive. I guess they just deleted the file she had on where she was meeting Kamir? Mog arrives just moments after they leave, and Basil doesn't say, Hey, the scent continues over this way. Useless prick. Mog also uses his hidden talent of terrifying presence to strike fear into the heart of May. She should remember who she killed as the mind white was only wiping her memory of Osha and Kamiya. She's acting as if it's erased the last 16 years of her memory. So Osha has become lovers with the man who killed her friend Yord and her potential love interest Jackie. I guess those really are the principles of someone who would turn to the dark side. Ooh, one final scene for season one of The Acolyte. What could it be? Answers to the remaining plot points? Some twist that turns the story from being hot garbage into the most inventive ending since The Sixth Sense. Oh my god, it's the back of Yoda's head. I was going to give this episode a 4 out of 10, but now it's a 10. Perfect score. Disney, you've done it again. But seriously though, this episode is a 4 out of 10. Some people don't like it when you criticise a character for not acting in the way you think you would act in the same position, but I think that's valid criticism provided it's not a difference in tastes. If a character turns down on a date with the hot blonde, it's okay because maybe he's into redheads. But if he turns down a date with the hot blonde because he has plans to go to his local singles night, that's just stupidity. This episode stole so many ideas and phrases from better entries in the franchise, and because it's a prequel, it's implying that this is the originator of these things. Force choking is a thing that Osha invented. Striking people down to complete their journey is now a Khmer thing. Those things were important because they informed us about this strange universe we were viewing while watching the movies. They heightened the tension in pivotal scenes. Here, they're just set dressing. Soul got done dirty. He went out like a bee and never even got to explain his side of the story. The introduction of Plagueis was pointless. Is he still living in that cave with Osha and Kamiya? And to top it all off, we had the reveal in the very last shot of Yoda. So now he's implicated in this whole kerfuffle. Not impressed, Disney. You can do better, especially at $180 million. I'll have a season review out in the next week with my thoughts on the overall story and the future for Disney Star Wars. 
it's not looking good. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie, thanks for your time, and have a good one.